Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to the Dice Tower. And today I want to talk a little bit about credit for games. Back in the day, when we go back in time and we take a look at uh, games that came out in yesteryear, in the first half of the 20th century and before that, you pretty much knew nothing about who a board game designer was. There were some notable exceptions to that. Monopoly went out of their way to tell you about Clarence Darrow, who technically didn't even design Monopoly anyway. It was Elizabeth Maggie. And a lot of people knew that Alfred Mosher Butts was the designer of Scrabble to the point where when he designed a second game, it was called Alfred's Other Game. But for the most part, people did not know designers. Designers did not get credit. They got paid. I remember as a kid, I remember reading an article about how to get a board game published. I was very excited about the time this was... In the 80s or 90s, I read this article, and they were essentially like, eh, send it in, maybe you'll get picked up or not. You know, designers did not have a particularly large amount of rights. In 1988, a group of German game designers made a pact at the Nuremberg Toy Fair in Germany. Basically, they said, none of us gives a game to a company if our name is not written on the box cover. This was signed on a coaster, which you can still find on the website, the picture of that, and a lot of German designers were written on here, including some that you might still might know. For example, Wolfgang Kramer was on there, and the late Alex Randolph was one of these designers. So they started an organization um, called the Spiel Autorin Zumpt, or S-A-Z for short, which is an organization that pushed for German designer rights. Um, they, they had a lot of different things here. For example, one thing they say on their website is game designers are the authors of their work, right? They say it's a self-evident statement, but they said on their website, but unfortunately this has been called into doubt time and time again. The SAZ will therefore continue to advocate on a political level for a clear and general recognition of game designers as authors. Uh, together with other cultural organizations, the SAZ is committed to further strengthening copyright law. Game designers are authors. That's a big deal. I mean, when you read a new book from famous author, whoever that author might be, that, you know that that's the author. Very few books come out and you're like, who wrote this? Like, eh, don't worry about it. No, I care. And so they're saying the same thing here with a board game design. The SAZ also does other things here that says they advocate fair conditions in the utilization of intellectual property rights regarding games. They make the creative faces behind the games better known. So... Does, do, do most people know who game designers are? And the simple fact is they do not. If you're watching this video or you're involved in board game as a hobby, you'll know game designers. But the number one thing most people know about a board game is the publisher. Oh, this was published by Fantasy Flight Games. This was published by CMON. This is published by Alea. Whatever the company might be, you tend to know that. And even that, people may not know. But in America, people know the names Hasbro, Mattel, things like that, but they very rarely know a board game designer's name. So here, making them known better is part of that reasoning. That's not a bad thing because it helps people, first of all, give someone credit for the hard work that they've done, but it also helps me go, oh, I like Uwe Rosenberg games. He's put out a new one. I like it. Movies have been doing this for a while. A new movie from Famous, uh, you know, Peter Jackson is putting out a new movie. I'm like, oh, I like Lord of the Rings. What else is Peter Jackson doing? And so if they're going to get credit for their work, well, then board game designers should also. The SAZ currently, has, well, according to the website, has over 600 members, but it's not the only organization. Uh, there's Ludo, which is an organization in Spain. There's the SAG, the same thing in France, and the TGDA in Australia. Recently, the bylaws were adapted in December 2023, but it was launched in May 6, 2024. The Tabletop Game Designers Association was begun. Founding members Jeff Engelstein, Elizabeth Hargrave, designer of Wingspan, and Senfun Lim. And this is doing the same thing now here in the English-speaking language. Although note the 35-year difference or 36-year difference in time from when it happening in Germany to happening here. And... So Jeff, who was one of the people who started this and also has been a friend of the Dice Tower for many years and has been on our, our podcast before, he said, even before the launch, we've had multiple requests for assistance in navigating sticky situations between designers and publishers. This underscores the vital need for this organization. 
The TTGDA helps level the playing field between designers and publishers. Games that are fairly made are better for the designers, the players, and ultimately the publishers too, said Cole Worley, game designer, summing up the importance of the organization. Their mission is to promote the craft of tabletop game design through education and support, to advocate for the designers of tabletop games within the industry, and, similar to the SAZ, to enhance the profile of the profession through proper attribution and recognition of contributions. So, are things better? Well, for sure. Definitely, game designers are on many boxes. In fact, the SAZ website says, on a positive note, more and more publishers started to name the authors not only on the cover, but also present the authors with a picture and a short text in the game rules or on the back of the box. And for some publishers, there are search engines on their websites where you can view their games, keep it up. And that's definitely something we've seen now, where you can see a little picture of the designer, and it tells you a little bit about them, and you get to know them and learn more about what they do. And more and more publishers are doing that. Um, should all publishers do it? I think so, actually. I think that's not a bad thing to have there to put in to your rule book or on the back of the box. Now, this still doesn't happen in the mass market much at all. You know, if you go out to your big box store, you go to Walmart or whatever, you buy a board game, and you finding the, the, the designer's name on the cover is likely not going to happen. And, you know, there's some collectives, too, and there's intellectual properties and things that can mess up the, the, that won't allow the designer's name to be on there. I've seen games that have been based on books, and the, the, the name of the author of the book was bigger than the name of the designer of the game. Um, it's interesting when we talk about collectives. So there have been different collectives. A very well-known one was Prospero Hall, where they were a collective of game designers, and just Prospero Hall was on the front of the box. When Prospero Hall, which no longer exists, then it's like, well... Who were those designers? Who was the designers? And what if there is a collaboration between, let's say, six different designers on a game? Do you put all six on the front of the box? What, what is the limit? Or what if I design the game and you help me do this part of it? Do we put your name on the box next to mine? Is my name bigger than yours? These are problems that I am not going to solve or even attempt to do so. You know, it's funny. I think about this because there are bands out there that make music and you know the band oh, this is music from Led Zeppelin or whatever the, the band is going to be, you may not know necessarily all the names of the people in the band, but you know the name of the band. Is that okay in the design world? And then, <clears throat> what about the other, other creative input? So lately, in the last decade or so, we have starting to see a lot of credit on boxes for the artist, which makes sense. Art is what's going to draw a lot of people to board gaming. Uh, if I go and I see that... A certain artist has illustrated a game. I'm, I'm very interested. And many of the games nowadays are putting the artist right next to the designer. Here we have the designer and we have the artist. Not all games do that, but that is a thing that happens. And is that where we stop? What about the person who does the 3D art, the modeler of the miniatures? A lot of games are miniature heavy. That person who modeled it, that's their work. Or what about the person who did the graphic design? Or the developer of the game who took this unshiny lump of coal that the designer brought and polished it into a beautiful gem. A great idea was there, but the developer did it. So I don't know how many names should go on the front of the box. I mean, at some point, it could get ridiculous just having a, a bunch of names and, oh, I'm the person who did this. Creatively, I think we can all agree, if you're watching this, I'm assuming you would agree, designer names should be on the box. Unless... I guess the designer has the choice of having their name on the box. If they want their name on the box, it should be on the box. And Hasbro and the other big companies will listen up. You should do that. You should give credit to somebody's hard work. I think it's also very nice to have the artist's name on the box. I don't know if that's necessary. It should be at least maybe on the back of the box. And then all these other people who are involved, should their names be on the front of the box? I don't know. There comes a point where it's cluttersome. Definitely credit should be given. Regardless, if people have part in the game, take some time in your rule book and thank them. Nowadays, games are getting crowdfunded, and you thank all your Kickstarter or GameFound backers and have two pages in the rule books with thousands of nonsensical names in there because they gave a little bit of money. Um, that's fine. I'm not a huge fan of that. I know why people do it. But you definitely want to thank the people who had the input into the game to make it what it is today. Some, some, some designers are so big, you know, that their name becomes part of the title. I've seen games with Reiner Knizia's 
blah, blah, blah. And that's the actual name of the game. How big do you put the name on the box? Does it need to be on the front or the back? So there's a lot of questions, and I'm not here necessarily to solve that, but I do like talking about the subject because I think it's interesting. I am thrilled to see, like this new organization, TT, uh, GDA, you know, the have this out there because game designers need an advocate. And it's far beyond just credit on the box, you know, like if there's a legal dispute or royalties, there's a whole lot of things that designers need rights for. That's important. But just the credit part, which is what I'm talking about in this video, that's an interesting subject. I think credit should go to where credit is due. I'm glad to see that it's gotten a lot better over the past several decades, and I hope that we see it continue to get better and better in the years to come. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching The Dice Tower by me and all my wonderful people who put this video together. Everybody, thanks for watching another video on the Dice Tower. Hey, do you want to know what's going on with the Dice Tower? Do you want to know about our events, our cruises, special things that we're going to do live here in the Dice Tower? Subscribe to the Dice Tower Digest. Go to DiceTowerDigest.com. It's a newsletter that we send out bi-weekly. We won't use your email for anything else. This is just to get you some information about the Dice Tower so you'll be up to date. Thanks for watching.